Okay, it's one o'clock, so it's time to start. Apologize for the little technical difficulties there. Hi, I'm Diane Zimmerman, and I'm real excited to do our very first Facebook Live. Um, unfortunately, expect some technical difficulties because this I'm not a techie person, I'm a corporate banker, so I'm not a techie person. Um, so thanks for attending, real excited. I really enjoy the amazing community of artists that we've created and that you are all a part of. It's so exciting to have over 100 countries represented. We even have someone in Antarctica. That's pretty amazing. Um, everyone in this group is so encouraging and helpful. I mean, the group is just amazing and it's an honor to be a part of it. Um, I wanna give a huge shout out to Kevin Hardy Wells, who is my partner in crime, my, my, um, God, my sounding board, he listens to me, he, um, he's just amazing to do this group with, and I don't think he's going to be able to attend today because he has to work, um, but thank you, Kevin, you are awesome. If y'all get a chance to send him a message and tell him how awesome he is, I'm sure he would appreciate it, and of course, he'd be embarrassed because he's very humble. I'm also excited to introduce Maureen Seba as our guest artist today. Woohoo, Woo she's here. We're both masked up here. We're following the pandemic guidelines. Um, she's been a professional artist for over 30 years. She's also a Golden Paints working artist and teaches group and private classes in her spare time. When I first start, started getting interested in um, painting, I started in acrylic and I needed some professional help. <laughs> and so once when I was at um, Jerry's Artorama, I asked the folks at the, at the cashier, um, I'm looking for someone who can teach a late beginner because I was, you know, 58, 59 at the time. And I said, the prerequisites are someone who has a ton of patience with people because I require a ton of patience. Just ask Kevin, just ask my husband, anyone who knows me. <laughs> and I want someone with a sense of humor who is fun, who will make learning fun. And everyone at Jerry's Artorama said, well, you got you to see Maureen. She's like perfect. She's, she's, she is your teacher, perfect for you. So that's how I found her. Um, also, I want to share that, in, in case you didn't notice one of the announcements from last night, that I just created an Instagram account for Watercolor Beginners and Beyond, so follow that. I'm real excited about the things we're going to do there. We're going to be featuring some of the members' artwork, of course, with your permission, um, whoever we feature. Um, and also, thanks to those who asked questions for today's session. I hope this is beneficial to you all. Um, if it is, we will continue to do more. Um, so let's get started. So Fi asked about warm and cool colors. What's warm, what's cool? So let's look at the color wheel. So if you divide the color wheel in half, you've got your yellows, your oranges, and your reds, and those are your warms. That's, that's pretty uh, obvious. And then the other half, your greens, your, your violets, and your blues, which are cool. So if that's true, then how can there be a warm blue? It can be really, really confusing. I've spent many, many hours reading about color theory, going to all the different um, artist websites who talk about um, color theory. Jane Blundell does an amazing job of it. She's probably got her PhD in hue and pigments. She's just, she knows a ton. So it, it's all relative. It's It's like, what is the blue next to? Yeah, blue is typically cool. These are all cool, but what is it next to? If you've got a, a warmer blue next to a cooler blue, then obviously that would be a warm blue. Okay, so let's look at some examples of cool and warm primaries. So the primaries, the primary hues are red, yellow, and blue. So we've got the warm primaries here, cad red, naphthol red. So FYI, a little bit about me, naphthol red is, and I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but that's how I say it, mm -hmm. is my favorite red. It is bold, it screams. When you put it on the paper, it's, I don't know if you can hear it, but it, I can hear it, it's just <laughs> screaming. It, it really enjoys paper. I just love naphthol red, it's just so bright. Another one of my favorites in the warm category is the Quinn Gold. Um, I like to cook and bake. I, that's one of my passions. 
and Quinn Gold to me is like butter. You add butter to any recipe and it's gonna make it better. So I use Quinn Gold a lot. Um, obviously the blues, Ultramarine and Danthrone. I don't know if I'm saying that right. And Danthrone Blue, those are the warmer um, blues. And then you've got the cool um, primaries. Uh, magenta, alizarin, crimson, permanent rose. These are just so pretty. I like to do a lot of tulip paintings with these right here. Um, lemon yellow, cad yellow light, another a couple of cool primaries. I probably use lemon yellow in almost every painting I do. I just, it, when I look at my palette, Quinn, um, Quinn gold and lemon yellow and naphthal red are always pretty much bare. I'm always having to add to it. Um, phthalo blue, cerulean are the cooler blues. So here's just a, a few of the, the warm and cool colors. But one thing that's really important in every painting that you all do is that cool colors recede. So you want the cool colors in the background and the warmer colors up front. It gives it as atmospheric perspective and it makes your painting so much more um, um, believable and pretty. Okay, so Belinda asked about neutral colors. So neutral colors are created when you take a, a, a hue from the color wheel and you add the opposite, the complementary color. So if you want to tone down red, you add green. If you want to tone down violet, you add yellow. It neutralizes it. So here we've got some colors that I'm going to mix for you. Um, and show you what they combine. You've got cad red and green, uh, phthalo green. So look at, this is how I have to paint the last few weeks. I think I'm on my third week. It's, it's pretty bad. So it's pretty good. It's, it's pretty bad. <laughs> and I put on makeup for the first time today in like months. I'm embarrassed to say that. My iPhone didn't even recognize me, the facial recognition. Is that recognition. Why you're not your face? <laughs> That's, yeah. So, you know, I've always said I wanted to paint looser. I have a tough time painting loose. Well, when I did my eye makeup, it was it's like crazy loose, so it's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not gonna be showing that. So I wanna show you what, what happens when you mix cad red and phthalo green. Get this beautiful neutral color here. And then alizarin crimson and sap green. This is one of my favorites. I'll get a little bit more pigment in there. And then ultramarine blue and cad orange. Oh, that's just so pretty. Now this alizarin crimson, it's a cool red and a warm green. It makes chocolate brown. It just makes me wanna eat a piece of chocolate. So Quinn Gold, I'm dropping my paintbrush here cause it's hard to hold. Quinn Gold and Diox Purple. Another beautiful neutral color. It's pretty amazing, uh, I think, that you can create so many different hues by mixing colors. When I first started painting, and, and Maureen can uh, attest to this, that when I say I have a limited palette, limited palette means like 24, 30, and she, she makes fun of me. She's like, that's not a limited palette. I said, yeah, it is, because it's not 60. <laughs> so I'm learning to work with less colors and doing more mixing. I think it makes the, um, the painting more harmonious. Um, I, I just really think that's important. So our next question comes from Linda. So, she asked how an artist finds their inspiration. So that's probably the hardest question to answer and it's different for each one of us. Um, I get my inspiration by looking at the beauty around me. Um, I look for the good in people as well as my surroundings. Maybe it's a blade of grass growing in a crack in the street. Um, I take pictures every day. I go for a walk with my husband when the weather's really nice. And of course, I've got my iPhone and I'm just taking pictures of anything that I just catches my eye. I will see a weed with a real pretty flower on it and, I, and I'm like stopping and leaning over taking a picture of this little weed and my husband's just like, well, that's, that's a weed. I'm like, but look at the color. I think that's alizarin crimson. 
Um, so I do take a ton of pictures and I sort them. I have all these different folders where I take pictures and, and categorize them on things I want to paint. Uh, this I wanna show, I took this, um, I think it was yesterday or day before, um, walking um, our morning walk and it is a, turn it the right way, a grocery cart that was in a ditch. And it had been there so long that grass and weeds had started growing through it. And I think I probably took 15 pictures of this grocery cart in the ditch. I just think it's very interesting. I like the, the composition of this picture. I like the blue. And it, it inspires me. It, it, I see that and it's different and it, it just inspires me. And you will be seeing this in the group at some point. Um, so I will be painting this sometime soon. Okay, moving along. Um, Karen asked what glazing means. She asked, is it just layers of watercolor? And Karen, you're absolutely right. Glazing is just adding layers of watercolor. Sometimes it could be the same color to deepen the values of that, of that color or hue, or it could be a different transparent color to change the hue. When I first started painting, my goal was I wanted to paint tulips. I wanted to paint tulip fields. I, I, that's, I love tulips. You all see a ton of my tulip pictures um, in the group. And I, I, just, I just love it. So Maureen was coaching me through with her rolled up newspaper to swap me on my hand. She's really a super nice lady, but I always make fun of her. Um, was, she probably wants to swap me with a newspaper. No, I don't. <laughs> but anyway, so for the, for the ground, for the grass of this tulip field that um, I was painting, she had me put yellow down first. I'm like, well, I, I need green. She said, don't worry, just trust me. We're gonna add yellow first. We're gonna get you green. I was very new to watercolor at the time. So I put yellow down and I was kind of disappointed because I'm like, I really, the grass is green. And then once the yellow dried, she had me glaze it with several shades of blue, leaving some of the yellow to poke through for the bright sun, sunlight hit, hitting the grass. And then when it dried, I walked away. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what glazing is. Now I'm going to hand it over to Maureen. Um, so Zen asked, how do you make a painting convey emotions and how do artists find their style? So okay. Maureen? Maureen's dealing with her dog right now. It's okay. Sorry, he got out. That's okay. Let me in here. So this is how to how to make painting convey emotions and explain how artists find their style. Oh, I know you're very passionate about that. I am very passionate about that. So, first of all, how do you find your style? This is a question that all my beginner students always ask me, and I'm going to sh show you what I tell them. You know, you all have a signature. You have to sign, well, nobody signs bank checks anymore, do they? You sign papers, right? You sign your paper with your, with your signature, not with typing your name, because everyone's signature is different. If someone tries to copy your signature, experts can tell. Your signature has your own style. Rembrandt had his own style in his signature. Look at Rembrandt's lines. Lines and brush strokes go hand in hand. If you make beautiful linear marks with pens or pencils or charcoal, you're gonna make beautiful brush strokes. So try to practice all kinds of different marks with your brush, with pencils, with everything. This is a Rembrandt drawing. Notice that nothing is perfect. He has gone back and restated things. He's yeah. not worried about getting it all perfect. Right, so Maureen won't allow me, when I'm doing sketches and practicing with that, she won't allow me to use an eraser. No erasers. They are <laughs> just, totally, absolutely I not necessary. Her. If she saw my bucket of erasers at home, she would probably throw them away. <laughs> I would. You better believe it. Because we don't make mistakes as artists. 
we are exploring with our eyes when we draw and when we paint. Now I'm gonna take Matisse, his signature. You see his signature here? Very different from Rembrandt. Matisse and Rembrandt. They each have their own styles. You can see Matisse's drawing style is way different than Rembrandt's. How did they achieve a style? The same way I did, the same way you will, by just drawing and painting. If you use a tutorial, you are going to learn techniques, but you're going to learn to paint like whoever you're copying from. Whoever is doing the tutorial, you're going to follow them and then you will not necessarily develop your own style. Look at Vincent van Gogh. He definitely had his own style. All artists do. Look at his marks. Look at his signature. So I'm saying that your style, here's Degas. Again, a very different style. How do you get here? You get there by practicing. So if you have pencil, a pencil would be handy. A pencil would be handy in this big studio full of art supplies. There's no pencil. So my signature See if you can do that, Diane. Can you copy my style? Well, don't even try. Do your own signature. My uh, I this is not There you go. That's you the see best I can do Diane that. has her style, <laughs> I have my style. So, your style will come automatically when you draw and paint. You will develop a style. If you try to do it, you, you don't have to try. It'll just happen. Did we cover the style? And now? Yes, you covered the style. And how can you make a painting convey emotions? Oh. Again... I'm going to go back to the tutorial, and that is it's very hard to be emotional when you're not emotionally connected with your subject. If you paint something that is meaningful to you, you will convey emotion yes. almost it's automatically. If you're painting, trying to copy a photograph, then it will probably come out looking a little stiff, unemotional, because you're trying hard to duplicate something that already exists. When you paint from your soul and from your heart, it's like an actor being truthful when they're acting. Right, that's, that's great. So I have improved a lot whenever I have just kind of gone off on my own. The paintings that get recognition from Maureen and some of the, my other professional artist friends are the ones that I'm surprised it gets recognition because I don't think they're that good. And they're like, Diane, oh my gosh, that's so you. That is you are coming through that painting. So I, I need to do more of that. Okay, so our next question is Brandy asked about examples of the different qualities of paints, you know, transparent only, granulating, semi-opaque. Maureen, this one is for you. Being a <laughs> golden artist, working artist, um, she knows a ton about paint. Well, I know a lot about pigments, pigments. and pigments are the uh, backbone of paints uh, because pigments are the tiny particles that get mixed in the binder with watercolor, the binder is usually gum arabic. In core, that's Q O R, stands for quality of result, a very original name that Golden tends to come up with. Uh, core uses a totally different binder with their pigments. Look at gum arabic. Here is a bottle of gum arabic that has been on my shelf for many years. Look at the color. Look at the color of it. It's, 
it used to be golden brown and now it's just brown. It's burnt umber. It's almost burnt, <laughs> see, burnt umber, right, it is. So look at what happens. This is what gum Arabic looks like. This is the binder in all, like Windsor Newton, all your other uh, lesser quality paints. The lesser quality paint is going to have less pigment particles. That's the tiny particles that make the pigment. Aquasol is used in conservation of fine art. And this is the binder in core. That's why core colors are so rich and vibrant and alive. If you look on the side of any tube of paint, you'll see these little uh, icons that are, are uh, explaining whether the color is opaque. Okay, opaque means you won't see anything through it. Semi-opaque, it's like a diagonal black and white. And as you see, here's Naples yellow. Naples yellow in its mass tone goes over the line and you can barely see the black line. When you do the draw down or more transparent Naples yellow, you'll see the line much easier. That's semi-opaque. Semi-transparent means you will see more of the black line than you do in the semi-opaque. And in the drawdown, again, you see a lot more of the line. Transparent, that is this square with nothing in it. This is cobalt violet, a very, very low tinting strength color. Uh, in fact, I don't even use cobalt violet because it's so low in tinting strength. It just kind of uh, disappears when you put it on the page. But as you can see, if you want to use a, a nice glaze of it, you can see underneath it very clearly. So you can see this line totally. Phthalo turquoise is a highly staining. All the phthalos are very staining colors. It means it takes very little to tint. Let's say if you're tinting, uh, adding, adding the color to white. If you put it in the mass tone, you cannot see the black line. As you draw down, you see a little more of the black line and Semi-staining, again, it's got the circle with the line through it, and there you have, it tells you on the tube of paint whether it is transparent or opaque. So which one would this be? This has a transparent yes. like a gold star. <laughs> it's transparent, and look at what it is. Thalo turquoise. Highly staining. It's got a square. You get an A+. I get an A+. Your prize is you get to take me to lunch. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, Brenda asked about composition, and, and this is something that I le have learned so much about um, with Maureen of not just putting an apple in the center of a paper. And I know she gets out the rolled up newspaper and wants to swap me. I'm like, but it's a good apple. She's like, move the apple. <laughs> Cut off that. Show us some tips about composition. Okay. If you have a painting and you're doing a vase of a vase, let's say and you put it in the middle of the paper. Oh, God, I'm bored already, I gotta quit because it's just, <laughs> it's just so boring that I can almost not bear it. Yeah, you probably couldn't even tell that was a vase. Well, that's because it doesn't have any values yet, but this is not what you wanna do because when anybody looks at a painting or anything else, your eye automatically goes directly to the center. Why would you put anything in the center? Because the eye is gonna go there anyway. You wanna grab the eye by placing it off center. So the best rule of thumb, whether you're using a, uh, a, a, a rectangle or a square or a circle, divide your paper. You can do it, you can eyeball it. This does not need to be measured out or overly uh, scientific. You just divide the paper into three parts. One, 
two, three. Notice that, see, I'm not worried about those lines being wonky. Is that <laughs> your word, word? wonky? Yes. Yeah, that's Diane's word. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to divide it the other way. Here we go. There it is. Now, one thing you don't want to do, and it's much easier to say what not to do, you don't want anything going to the corners. This is a big no. See how that made an X? That means don't make a composition like this. It's boring. It divides everything evenly, and the viewer will go right off the page. Also, what is the one that we always talk about? How about this? Well, there's my horizon line, because I like the sky and I like the, I like the land. So, put my mountains here, right? No, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do that. You want to decide whether you want to show the viewer the sky, which means you put your horizon line down here, and these will be clouds at that point <laughs> or something. <laughs> or you show them the ground and just a little sky up there. Back to the four square, or what do we call that? Hopscot? No. Uh, tic tac toe. Tic -tac -toe. Oh, thank you. Tic-tac-toe, you just roughly divide your paper into thirds, both horizontally and vertically. You want the major point of interest, which means the point of highest contrast or the point where complementary colors meet. That will draw your eye there instinctively. Choose one of these points and then choose the other point, one of the other points, that's gonna be your secondary interest. So you wanna put something a little less bold that's going to draw the viewer's eye down here. Then you can choose any one of the other points and make something interesting there. You don't wanna put anything here. You don't want anything going to the corners. That should be sort of gray and unimportant and uninteresting. Block the viewer from going off the corners by not putting interesting things there, right? You want to create this ping pong where they look here, then they go here, then they go there, and they go back there. So you keep them in, it's not ping pong, it's what do you call those uh, games where they play the, the uh, pinball, pinball, <laughs> bounce around. So that keeps the viewer's eye in your painting. It's not in the middle. Your interest is here, and then here, and then here. That's foolproof composition. And there are lots of other little tricks about composition that you can go into for a whole hour and a half, but I'm turning it right back over to Diane. Okay. So our last question is from Jan, is how do you control your brush to make small strokes like fur on a cat? I always just use dry brush technique to give an impression of fur, and Maureen, what else would you suggest? I'd say yes, that's a good idea. I love dry brush. You can also use, this is a black velvet made by silver brush, number eight. I just wanna point this brush out because if I use any brush, this is the brush that I need to bring with me. I don't need any other brush but this if I'm doing watercolor. Well, I don't have one like that. Well, we're going to have to fix that I up for Jerry's you. Jerry's is open. Uh, they don't carry silver brush, sadly. Oh, okay. No, but Art Supply on Almeda carries oh, okay. silver brush. And I know Texas Art does as well. I might be wrong about Art Supply on Almeda. I think she does. But now I'm going to take this funny looking, believe it or not, it's a... It started off as a, uh, uh, what is this, a hummingbird? <laughs> <laughs> and look at this silver brush. This is an ultra mini pointed round. Look at this. Look at how tiny the little brush is. Very flexible though. Lasts a long time. And I can make my fur like this. This is not fur. What is a hummingbird? Feathers. <laughs> The pandemic is getting See? better. The isolation. 
I spent too much time with Diane this morning. <laughs> no, anyway, this is a great brush for achieving all kinds of interesting tiny lines. Oop, look, I just made a dot. That makes another interesting mark. The key is the most interesting parts of a painting are when you have a variety of marks. Not all the same. I just wanted to throw that in. Thank you, Diane. Oh, thanks, Maureen. Um, and we had a couple of extra questions that were, would take probably a full hour just to do those. Um, so Brenda had asked how to take a photo and break it down to turn it, turn it into a painting. And I've done a lot of those, and there are some tricks and tips to do that. Um, I will do another tutorial or, or a Facebook Live and, and show what my process is. And Belinda asked about how to see the value of hues in a picture. Um, so since these topics takes quite some time to answer, I will schedule, if y'all feel this is, is useful to you all, I will schedule another uh, Facebook Live soon to address that. So I hope this call didn't last but 30 minutes. I wasn't quite sure how long it would take because it was our first. Um, and I do, unfortunately, if you're asking questions in the comments, I'm not able to see those while we're recording. So I don't know if Neither the, am I because my phone, phone wouldn't. I don't know if the replay is going to let me see those questions. I have no idea. But if you have some specific questions you'd like to ask, just to put it in a post and, and post it and, and ask, ask your questions. Um, I hope that you found this helpful um, and that it was fun. And I want to thank Maureen for her expertise and hope she wants to do another one with us. I really got a lot out of the composition discussion that she shared with me months ago. I have one quick thing I'd okay. like to add. Okay. One very, very quick thing. Somebody had posted in the group about how uh, they weren't happy with the color that they had in their painting. And I just wanted to say this. Remember, watercolor is the most forgiving medium. It's a myth that watercolor is difficult. It's actually the opposite. Watercolor is the easiest medium because watercolor is resoluble. Meaning, if you don't like what you have there, just put it under the faucet and rinse it off. It's super easy to do. Or, here's one more thing you could possibly do. You could buy this cold press ground. They also make a watercolor ground. It's, it's made by Golden, it's core. And it is made to be exactly the same color as Arsh uh, cold press paper. And the watercolor ground is also made to, to match Arsh paper. Now, cold press has a little bit more texture, as you can see maybe. And the watercolor ground is smoother. So depending upon the surface you want, you don't like what you paint, just paint this right over it. And that'll give you back, get you back to your paper. I got a sample of that a few months ago and I had done a painting of a truck. I don't know if you remember that. Oh yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. red truck in the field. Oh yeah, that was great. And I really messed up the antenna in the sky area. And I, I was just devastated because it was the first painting I felt like I the training wheels were off that I did all by myself. <laughs> I didn't know trucks had training wheels. <laughs> yeah, I know. This one did. And so she suggested some um, watercolor ground and I kind of put some over it with a palette knife, let it dry, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I fixed this. Instant it's, eraser. It's sort of like using icing on a cake. If you've got a cake that's got <laughs> holes in it or whatever and you want to have a pretty icing layer on top, just cover up that hole with icing and then it's all nice and smooth. So if you have cheap paper and you coat it with okay. this, this is also not very expensive, it makes a great ground and will improve oh, your paper oh yeah take cheap paper and a use a palette of... knife with some watercolor cold press ground or watercolor ground the watercolor is more like hot press then there you go well that's that's a good tip i did not know that that's pretty amazing so again i hope this was helpful to you all 
Um, I wish we could all meet together. Um, I would love to have everybody over. I think I'd have to rent out the Astrodome. The, the group is so big. And I don't think I could cook for that many people. Oh, yeah, you could. You could. Well, I'd have to start like now for March. <laughs> so thank you all so much. I really appreciate everyone's participation in the group. Um, this is such an amazing group of people. Y'all are so just kind. I see so much kindness in the group. And this is the time that, you know, what we've all been through the past nine months or so, we need more kindness more than ever. So y'all are just amazing. So I appreciate that. I look forward to looking at the page every day. I don't get to see everyone's painting. I really try. I really try to, to comment and, and like the paintings because y'all just blow me away. Um, from beginner to the beyonders, I just get so impressed. Um, so y'all are just awesome. Thank you so much. And again, Kevin, I hope you were able to attend. If not, I hope you watched the replay. Kevin, I could not do this without you. So I really, really appreciate your help. And someday I will actually get to meet you in person. We've never met. I know people think that we're like next door neighbors, but we're not. <laughs> I'm in um, Texas and he's in Virginia. So um, anyway, thank you all so much. And thanks, y'all. Yeah, thank you. Y'all have a great day. Bye. Bye. -bye.